Hello Star Wars fans and welcome to my latest Star Wars book review for July 2018 and as promised I will be reviewing five of the famous X-Wing books, specifically the five written by Michael A. Stackpole, the one who created the lineage of X-Wing books to begin with. And yeah, in the mid to late 90s these books were... Uh, some of the more exciting books in the Expanded Universe, and it was nice to get this little offshoot series of uh, different stories that kind of set the stage for what we would eventually see in a movie like Rogue One, where it's like, hey, let's make stories about the pilots and the rogues and the other rebels that typically get blown up in these big battles. Um, let's actually give them personalities and relationships and stories so that when something bad actually does happen to them, we'll care beyond just... Oh, there's another rebel that bit the dust, and oh, there's a, you know, there, there's another one that crashed. Oh no, poor Biggs. Um, this book actually expands, again, building off the expanded universe, it expands on what we know in the movies and what we see in the movies, and gives us this nice little set of different stories um, focused around these group of characters, specifically the ones that Michael A. Stackpole wrote centered around the new Rogue Squadron, which was formed after the events of Return of the Jedi. Um, and after, you know, there were various vacancies that needed to be filled. So, uh, we followed that group, uh, throughout the books written by Stackpole and, uh, resulting in some very interesting and very fun adventure stories, um, that don't revolve strictly around Jedi, although one of them, specifically the main one, turns out to have Force powers, be Force sensitive, and ultimately does become a Jedi. Um, there isn't too much focus on the Force or on the Jedi. This is just an excuse to tell uh, more action-oriented um, stories about dashing, daring, and brave pilots. So there's kind of like this adventure serial aspect uh, to these books. They kind of feel like they could have been a serial, especially when you look at the cliffhangers that take place from one book to another. Uh, it really felt like something that could have been filmed in like the 30s or 40s and would have worked in that style of... Uh, that style of storytelling, but um, one of the things I really like about these books, uh, probably the main thing I like, and was kind of the most attractive thing to me when I first started reading them, was the expanded role of one Wedge Antilles. Now, let's talk about Wedge Antilles. One of the reasons that the expanded universe was so great is that it took all these side characters and all these um, guys that weren't main characters, didn't really fit into the main story of the Star Wars trilogy, but were memorable for one reason or another. In Wedge's case, he was one of the pilots uh, that flew alongside Luke, and he was also the only pilot that we saw that survived all three of the major battles in the movies. He survived the Battle of Yavin, he survived the Battle of Hoth, and he survived the Battle of Endor. And uh, from what we could tell as the audience, he was the only X-Wing pilot that uh, participated in and survived all three battles. Uh, Luke was not an X-Wing pilot in the Battle of Endor, so um, I'm not counting him in that discussion, but that made Wedge somewhat interesting. It's like, who is this guy that keeps surviving all these battles and actually got to blow up the second Death Star at the end of Return of the Jedi? Um, it's kind of like he's the good guy version of Boba Fett in that sense that I want to know more about that guy. He doesn't do anything, but I'm curious. I, I want to see him do more and um you know the fans have always kind of built it up in our heads that wedge is just as brave and just as good a pilot as luke was and he doesn't have the force powers to back it up he's just a really good pilot and here in these books we get to see him in a place of authority where he has to be uh the leader of the rogues uh the one who has to um determine who the best pilots are to fit it within the rogue squadron and he's the one that has to answer to you know the the new republics higher up like admiral akbar and borsk Felia and princess leia and various others uh he's the one that has to be basically the spokesperson for the rogues and the liaison between the government and uh this elite piloting force that he's uh created and uh, seeing him in a position of authority and in the role of teacher and trainer uh, to get these pilots into shape, uh, specifically in the first book where he really has to put Corrin Horn, and I'll talk more about Corrin in a minute, but um, where he really has to put the kid in his place and really teach him some lessons and teach him, like, no, this is the right way to do things. You're a bit brash, you're a bit cocky. This is how you're supposed to do things. And uh, I guess I'll start with the first book, 
which would be Rogue Squadron, very appropriately titled, considering that was the book where the new Rogue Squadron was developed. And in that book, it has a very Top Gun feel to it, where it's largely centered around the pilots and their training and getting them ready for these big missions. And like I said, the main character is Corrin Horn, and he ultimately becomes kind of the Luke Skywalker of the X-Wing books, where specifically the Rogue Squadron-centric X-Wing books, where it is revealed that uh, he's ultimately a Jedi and a Force-sensitive, and he gets a lightsaber, and he even goes on to play big roles in, like, the new Jedi Order, which those reviews are going to start up again soon, I promise. But um, he starts off as this brash, cocky young pilot and eventually matures throughout the course of the books. Uh, he finds love as well as he falls in love with Mirex, Mirax? That's the most unattractive female name I've ever heard. Mirax? I believe that's how it's pronounced. Um, but, uh, yeah, uh, Corrin's father and her father, Booster, don't like each other, so they have a history, so they don't start off in the best of terms, but they ultimately come to love each other and get married and all that fun stuff, but, um... Corrin, uh, unlike some of the other failed attempts at trying to cre recreate Luke Skywalker, uh, Kip, I'm looking at you, uh, Corrin's actually kind of likable and is this kind of, he's got a little bit of Han in him and a little bit of Luke in him, so he's kind of this fun mix of the two, and he goes through so much shit throughout the books that it's kind of fun to watch him kind of dig himself out of these holes that he constantly finds himself in, and by the end of it, he's a fully realized and more mature, um, representative of the Rogue Squadron, uh, best pilot of the bunch. Um, <clears throat> there's a few other characters that get introduced. Uh, one of the things I do like about the books, um, and it happens actually in the first book as well, where some of the pilots die. And, which, again, very uh, similar to how the rebel pilots end up in, in the actual movies, where some of them, do, you know, they go to war, they go into these battles, they get blown up. Um, so we do lose pilots throughout the course of the books, uh, specifically in the first one, where, which was kind of a, a real turning point uh, for the rogues and for um, these characters. Is like, oh yeah, we could die at like any moment. It doesn't matter how good a pilot we are. We could we could easily get blown up um, at any time. Uh, actually, one of the pilots is Gavin Darklighter, who is the younger brother of Biggs Darklighter, who was Luke's friend from Tatooine who's probably most well-known for getting blown up in the Battle of Yavin in the first movie. So it's, uh, it was nice to have that piece of continuity there and having a, a, you know, a younger relative try to live up to the mantle of Darklighter and uh, you know, avenge his brother and all that other stuff. So it was um, uh, the first book is really good, and again, like I said, it has a very Top Gun feel to it. Uh, these books also take place, specifically the first four, I should note, uh, the first four books take place pretty much immediately after Return of the Jedi and detail how the Rebel Alliance take over Coruscant and ultimately leads to them uh, establishing the New Republic. And, uh, you know, if you have these new heroes, you gotta have a villain. And we have Director Isard, or Isard, I'm not sure how to pronounce it, but she is uh, the de facto leader of the Imperial Center. Um, she is leading the charge on Coruscant while what's left of the Imperials is being splintered off with all these different leaders. Um, this is before Grand Admiral Thrawn would make his presence known. You had Warlord Zinj, who's off doing his own thing. And she's kind of being the stable core of, of the Empire, uh, trying to keep things afloat on Coruscant, while also concocting her own plan uh, to ultimately destroy the New Republic and the Rebellion. <laughs> And actually, uh, the plan she concocts is to let them take over Coruscant, but unleash this virus that kills and affects non-humans uh, while she takes over their supply of Bacta, and she plans that uh, the Republic will just eat itself from within as every, all the non-humans get sick and everything. And so, very devious, very cold. She's described as a bit of a... Just a very, like, ice-cold personality. Um, and I've, I've talked about this before in the past. There were various attempts to try and recreate Grand Admiral Thrawn in the books. Uh, most of them are not successful. I've used Admiral Dalla as, like, the prime example of that. Uh, Warlord Zinge was another one who I thought was, again, trying to be somewhat like Thrawn, but failed um, at conveying that same sense of menace and intelligence. Isard is the, the closest, I think, to... Uh, being up on Thrawn's level, she doesn't quite have the same thought process or 
uh, interesting uh, way of thinking about things that Thrawn does. But she is so cold and menacing that it, it's, it's kind of easy to kind of be afraid of her a little bit. So she makes for a good adversary for these young, brash, cocky rogues that are... Uh, just out to spoil her fun. So uh, the first book set the stage very well. Again, very Top Gun-like. And actually, most of the books uh, feel like different things. When you get into the second book, which is Wedge's Gamble, which details the rogues trying to infiltrate Coruscant and try to make uh, a partnership with several agents of the Black Sun, uh, you know, the uh, criminal organization led by Prince Caesar in Shadows of the Empire, because, you know, in the expanded universe, everything connects, and there's all these little pieces, and everything comes back at some point. But in this book, they're playing more spies, and they're infiltrating Coruscant and trying to uh, subvert from within, take over Coruscant, and uh, ultimately establish it as the centerpiece of the New Republic. Um, ultimately, Isard uh, plans for this to happen, um wants them to take over Coruscant so she can unleash the, uh, the Kratos virus and, uh, again, do what I talked about earlier with her trying to take over, or her trying to cause the New Republic to basically destroy itself by letting them just take Coruscant and then, uh, putting them in a more vulnerable position that'll make them easier to conquer later. And, uh, yeah, that book, again, had more of a spy movie type of vibe to it. Maybe a little bit of a detective story with them having to go out on the streets and make connections and uh, a little bit like that. So very different from the first book. Not quite as action-heavy uh, and not quite, uh, not detailing as much about, you know, X-Wing battles or anything like that. But uh, still a very fun read and a nice continuation. And I should bring up at this point that... One of the major story threads going throughout the books is are the loyalties of Captain Tycho, who is a friend of Wedge's, one of the former rogues, but because he was a prisoner of uh, the Empire at one point and he escaped, some people suspect that he's actually a spy for the Empire and he can't be trusted. And his loyalties are constantly brought into question throughout the books. And actually, uh, we do get him um, on trial in the third book, because the second book ends with a bit of a downer, as it looks like Corrin Horn is dead, and Tycho gets blamed for it. So that sets up the third book. Turns out Horn is not dead, he's been captured by Ars Isard and kept prisoner on her own personal Super Star Destroyer, uh, which is kind of her crown jewel and the leader of her, uh, you know, the leading ship of her fleet of Star Destroyers. Uh, I believe the ship was called the Lysankia, and it's a big prison ship. And, th like I said, that'll lead us into the third book, The Kratos Trap, in which the trap is sprung where the Kratos virus has been unleashed on Coruscant, and the rebellion uh, is kind of falling apart at the scenes with Tycho on trial and Corn Horn um, being locked away in this prison, uh, this prison ship, uh, the Super Star Destroyer. And he's got to figure out a way to get off of it, let everyone know he's alive, and let everyone know what Isard is up to and what's going on. So, <clears throat> uh, this one is a bit more of a prison break story with a courtroom drama thrown into it. So, again, very different vibe. I like that Stackpole took that approach because it would have been very easy to just write X-Wing battle, X-Wing battle, X-Wing battle, X-Wing battle. And it would have been like, you know, Top Gun, again, it's a great movie. It didn't get a sequel for a reason because how can you... You know, it's very hard to keep just keep telling that same story over and over and over again. Here... You know, he does different things with it. It's like, all right, we get the spy story. Now we're getting courtroom drama and a prison break movie and uh, all that other stuff. So I, I like that the books feel different. I like that he took that approach with the books. And it made the series a lot more fun to read because of that. And um, Horn's development leads to him finding out that he has he's a Force-sensitive and he's got Jedi powers. And that would actually lead to his development, uh, you know, many books down the road as we get to the new Jedi Order. But again, I'll get there when I get there. But <clears throat> um, he ultimately does escape, and it's proven that Tycho is innocent. And uh, that leads us into the fourth book, where now that the Rebels know that this virus has been unleashed and they have to try and stop it, they need Bacta. Bacta being the medical fluid, uh, the, uh, the medicinal... Um, a substance that is used in the Star Wars universe to heal wounds and cure sicknesses, and they need that stuff uh, to combat the Kratos virus and save the non-humans within the Rebellion uh, that have been infected by the virus. Um, uh, Isar takes control of Thyferia, which controls uh, the Bacta resources, so now the Rebellion has to battle Isard 
for the Bacta, hence the fourth book, The Bacta War. And this was really the concluding book in this arc uh, for the rogues. Uh, so this served as a nice conclusion period to this uh, four book story arc where it's like, all right, it's the rogues versus Isard, the final battle, here we go. And again, serves as a nice conclusion. It feels like the return of the Jedi of uh, the X-Wing books. And overall, if Sackpole had just stopped there, which he actually took a break from the X-Wing books for a while after that one, if he had stopped there, I think it would have been nice Four book set, very good story arc. Um, Aaron Alston would take over and write the Wraith Squadron X-Wing books, uh, which I'll talk about those at a different time. But um, he took a little bit of a break from X-Wing. Um, you know, in this book, it looked like Isard had been killed and the, the New Republic was now in control of Coruscant. And now we've set the stage for the Thrawn trilogy and the events that would happen in that book. Uh, or in those books, that trilogy. Um... So it looked like maybe the Rogue Squadron stories were done, at least from Michael Stackpole's perspective. But a few books later, we would get this one. Isard's Revenge, the fifth and final book to center on the Rogue Squadron and feature Michael Stackpole as the writer. And um, this book jumps ahead a little bit. This one takes place after the Thrawn trilogy. So this is after the New Republic has been established. They took over Coruscant. Then they dealt with Thrawn. And now uh, we're getting this final story where they deal with Isard one last time. Turns out she wasn't dead. Crazy. She's like a like a slasher movie villain. <coughs> and actually, this book literally starts off with the final battle against Grand, Ad Grand Admiral Thrawn, where he's killed, and the Rebellion, the New Republic, ultimately defeats uh, his forces. So, what we get here is an interesting setup where Isard wants to uh, make nicey-nice with the Republic and wants to be granted amnesty, so she cuts a deal with the rogues to concoct this plan to overthrow this uh, one of the last remaining Imperial warlords on this planet who runs this uh, really horrible uh, prison world or whatever. Um, and she wants... Uh, she's going to help the rogue squadron stop him, overthrow him, and she would be granted amnesty in the process. And there's actually a great moment in the book uh, where she talks to Corrin, and they really state their two conflicting uh, philosophies. And that was great to see. You know, she's been the main villain throughout this whole thing, and Corrin's been the main hero. So to have that moment at this stage of the story, to have them talk to each other and kind of butt heads a little bit while they're technically on the same side at this point uh, was really good. Um, my only major knock on this book would be that at no point was I at all convinced, and they even tell you right away, basically. Uh, at no point was I convinced that Isard was completely on their side. I'm like, she's going to screw him over the first chance she gets. And sure enough, it was like her plan all along. Um, although I do like all the scenes of her, uh, you know, they're uh, training the rogues to fly TIE fighters. So that's, again, a little something different. Um, so, uh, yeah, a lot of... A lot of good stuff in these books. I really enjoyed it. I think the fifth one is probably my least favorite of the five, but I think overall, really strong series of books. Um, and just really fun, exciting stories. And that's really Star Wars at its finest, isn't it? They really do... They read very well while also giving us something a little bit different from what we would normally get in the movies. So um, it's my understanding that the X-Wing books are very popular and with good reason. I think, like I said, they offer something different. Um, they're very exciting, action-packed, and, you know, they have good characters and different situations to put them in in each book, which is, really feels like each book is fresh, each book is exciting on its own, and the combined package makes for a very nice set of books. So, uh, yeah, that concludes my review. I, I recommend these books. I think they're really good. I wouldn't rank them up there amongst the best of the best, not up to like the Thrawn trilogy standards or anything akin to that, but I think on their own, I think they're very good. I think they're very fun reads and I highly recommend them. And actually they were recommended to me by a lot of people before I ever even got around to reading them. So uh, take that for what it's worth. So yeah, that concludes this review. Uh, come back next month. I'll have another one lined up for you. So until next time, may the force be with you guys.